So this week's Torah portion is called what? Anybody remember? Pinchas, yeah. Or in uh, some of your translations, it'll say Phineas. It's easier to say, but it's funnier sounding. Pinchas. Um, it's found in Numbers chapter 25 and in verse 10. Na- Numbers 25, 10. I think is how your Bibles are going to have it. Numbers 25, 10. Bamidbar 25, 10 is where the, the Torah portion starts. We're going to read a little bit, but before we jump into this week's Torah portion, let me set the stage. Just what happened last week with the Torah portion is Bilam infiltrated the camp, if you remember. Yeah, go for it. Bilam infiltrated the camp, and he convinced the Israelites to uh, get a little too friendly with the Midianite women, if you recall, right? Um, they were seduced into idolatry and into adultery, which is the same thing at its core, same thing at its root. Um, spiritually speaking, idolatry is the same as adultery. And uh, they were convinced, and so eventually um, they're at this point where they're, I mean, they're doing full-fledged Baal worship within the, within the, the precincts of the tabernacle, um, which is not a good idea if you want to be on God's good side, right? So this man, who was a descendant of Aaron, uh, Aaron's uh, grandson, if I'm not mistaken, by the name of Pinchas, he's had enough, and he comes to a point where he picks up a spear, and he impales uh, two individuals. Do you guys know their names? What are their names? Cosby is the female. And who was the male involved? Zimri. Yeah, Zimri. Zimri is a son of who? Simeon. Yeah, he's of the tribe of Shimon. The tribe of Shimon. Who is the... Uh, who, Pinchas is of the tribe of who? Levi or Levi. Levi. Yeah, uh, we say Levi. In Hebrew, it actually be pronounced Levi. Um, anybody know Levi jeans? Levi jeans. Yeah, those are manufactured by, originally started by, um, yeah, you're wearing something good? Um, by, by a descendant of the tribe of Levi. Um, anybody seen, uh, there's signs around Dothan. It's a judge running for, or someone running for judge by the last name Cohen. You ever seen those? That, is it a female or male? Anyways, they are a descendant of, of, of Aaron. Because you may see uh, last names like Khan or Cohen. They can trace their lineage all the way back to the descendants of Aaron. They know that they are, and that's important because when the temple was rebuilt, they'll know that they are Kohanim and they can serve as priests in the temple. So you may see that. Um, but a little factoid for you. So they're impaled uh, and there's a, a plague that breaks out. There's 24,000 people that die in this plague. So these, these two brothers, descendants of these two brothers, Shimon and Levi, and uh, they're very zealous. And so let's, ju- let's jump over to verse 10 of Numbers chapter 25. We're going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to tell you a story. Um, verse 10. Adonai said to Moshe, Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aharon, the Kohen, he has deflected my anger from the people of Israel by being as zealous as I am. What do your translations say there? Jealous. Jealous. Okay. Anybody have being in my zealousness or having my zealous? My jealousy, yeah. Okay. So he was being zealous as I am zealous, so that I did not destroy them in my own zeal. Therefore say, I am giving him my brit shalom, my covenant of peace, making a covenant with him and his descendants after him, that the office of the Kohen, the priest, will be theirs only till the temple is destroyed. No. Only till this thing called the church age comes around. No. What's the word there? Yeah. Olam. It's forever. There is no change in that. There's no reversing that. So a Kohen today is a priest. And they will be a priest forever. There is no changing that. Um, Many people get confused and they think, oh, the order of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, uh, replace the order of, of Aharon. That's not true. It didn't replace it. The, the order of Melchizedek is what is operating in the heavenly realm right now. But the earthly realm, the, the order of Aharon is on pause. It's on pause. It's not operating in the earthly temple. Okay? But it will return, as we see in the book of Isaiah and other, other prophets. It will return. So be careful. Don't get confused on that. Um, this is because he was zealous on behalf of his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So how did he make atonement? 
how did he make atonement for the people of Israel? Remember, there's a plague breaking out. There's 24,000 people that are dying. He spears two people, and the word of God says that that made atonement for the people of Israel. So it's interesting, the death of, of somebody, the death of somebody makes atonement for a bunch of other people. It's interesting. The name of the man from Israel who was killed, put to death with the woman from Midian, was Zimri, the son of Salu, the leader of one of the clans. This guy was a big deal. He, was, he wasn't just a Joe Schmo. He was a leader. He was one of the princes of the clans from the tribe of Shimon. Shimon comes from the word Shema, Shema, to hear and understand. Shimon means like to, to basically to hear, to hear, the hearing. But Shimon, the, a descendant of Shimon, is the one involved here. He's the perpetrator. And he was killed, uh, uh, Cosby, the daughter of Sur, uh, and he was the head of the people in one of the clans of Midian. So this, uh, this lady by the name of Cosby, she was one of the princes of the Midianites. She was not just a um, run-of-the-mill woman who um, you know, was just out on the edges of the camp. This was, this was nobility for the Midianites that was sent in to, to seduce a son of Shimon. So we're going to stop right there, and I'm going to tell a story. Um, how many times do we see the word zeal mentioned here in just those few verses? Count them. How many say, I heard somebody say it. Yeah, it's like three or four, depending on your translation. Three or four. So um, let me tell a story, and I'm going to get into what godly zeal means. Uh, this trash can... <clears throat> One day I was down in Lakeland. You're going to know where I'm going with this. One day I was down in Lakeland. And um, just like here, uh, we have recycle bins, right? And you put all your plastic bottles in the recycle bin and whatever. Well, ours filled up because I forgot to take it out for a couple of weeks, I think. And I used this as my overflow bin for my recycle stuff. And I thought, okay, the guy is going to see that my bin's full. He's going to empty that. And he's going to get out of his truck and dump this in there or whatever. So I set it out by the mailbox just like that. And it's full of plastic bottles. And um, uh, scrap metalers, people who go around and get scrap metal are really common in my neighborhood down there. And uh, this guy comes along in this, in this old beat up Chevy van and Stacy and I are sitting on the front porch drinking coffee and we're watching this van pull up and uh, he jumps out, he takes the trash can, opens up, our, opens up our big trash can, dumps all this into the trash can, throws this in the back of his van and then takes off. Stacy's sitting there watching this. Her mouth is just wide open. He just took my trash can. And I, and I was like, Stacy, she bought this out of like a secondhand store for like a dollar or a yard sale or something. It's like, Stacy, it was just a dollar. Don't worry. Don't calm down. But she had that look on her eye. Like her eyes just like rolled back in the back of her head, you know? And she just like started smearing that war paint on, you know? And I was like, Stacy, Stacy, calm down. But it was on. It was on. The guy, the guy is gone, you know, and I'm trying to calm her down. She's barefoot, probably in her pajamas because we were just woken up that morning. She runs in the house, grabs the keys to my car, and is, I mean, barefoot, pajamas, looks cray, jumps in the forerunner and is chasing this dude down. She's going to get this trash can. She, she follows him maybe a mile later, tracks this guy down, swerves out in front of him and puts it in park. And she gets out. She's like, excuse me, you took my trash can. That was not trash. It was holding trash, but you took my trash can. Can you imagine Stacy saying that to a complete stranger in a, in a creepy van full of scrap metal? And she went after that guy. She was like a pit bull. And uh, he, back, he said, whoa, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here's your trash. And he dug around in the back of his van, found the trash can, and gave it back to her. I'm so sorry. So she gets back. And I'm still drinking coffee, sitting on the front porch. She pulls up, and I'm just smiling, thinking. She gets, she opens the back door, and she has her trash can, and she just, and she looks at me, and she's like, "Don't you ever put my trash can out there again?" <laughs> and I was like, "Ma'am, it was on. You don't want to make Stacy mad." My dad would always say, "Don't marry a woman until you see her mad." Yeah. <laughs> don't make Stacey mad. But that is what I call zeal, right? She had a zeal for her trash can. And she got back, and it was actually apologetic. She felt bad for the guy. She thought she came off a little too strong. Um, she thought maybe she scared him, and she probably was pretty scary. But, yeah, no. Um, I wanted to ask you all, I sent out an email teaser question. Um, what are, what, who would you say, if you had to pick, who was the most zealous person in the Bible 
So if you saw my email, you would, you maybe thought your, your wheels were turning. Who is the most zealous person in the Bible, character in the Bible you think is the most zealous? Mm-hmm. Anybody have any thoughts? Anybody? Paul. Paul? Yeah. Paul, my Paul. That's right, Paul. <laughs> yeah, who broke my board? Anybody know who broke my board? Yeah. You can fix my radiator Yeshua. right up. Who? Yeshua. Yeshua, yeah, he's pretty zealous, right? Pretty zealous. He actually says that he was consumed with zeal for my father's house. Yeah, in John chapter 2. Anybody else? Yeah. John Ooh, yeah. We'll put, uh, we'll put uh, J the B. John the Baptist, or Yochanan the Immerser. Anybody else? I heard Elijah. So we'll put Eliyahu. Eliyahu. Eliyahu Hanavi. Elijah, yeah. Moses. Moses was pretty zealous, yeah. Got to be. Moses. Anybody else? Y'all are naming good people. What about bad people? Herod, yeah. Herod was pretty zealous, yeah. Zealous about himself, right? Anybody else? I got one that comes to mind. But I'm waiting for a, a, a lady to say it so I don't get in trouble. Anybody? Jezebel. Yeah, oh, there you go. I didn't think of that one. I don't know how to spell it. I don't know how to spell it. Yeah. She probably like trash cans now. Gabe, call his wife Jezebel. <laughs> Anybody else have any uh, zealous people in the Bible? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not even going to try to write that one. That's just what. <laughs> Neb, Neb. Neb. Yeah, there's some good ones. What? Cain. Cain. We got Cain and Abel. Yeah. In town this week. Oh, yeah. Peter. Peter, yeah. Peter. I'll put him up here. The good people. Peter was very zealous. Anybody else? Mm. Yeah. Pretty much all the disciples. All the disciples had to be pretty zealous, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll put the disciples, the Talmudim, in Hebrew, Talmudim. The disciples. The Bible, this entire book, is written about and through zealous people and by zealous people wrote this book. This book would not be penned if it were not for all of these people writing the book, or being a part of the story of the book, um, zeal is what makes the Bible tick. Oh, is that LT? I heard about you. You're here for Hebrew, aren't you? Good deal. You excited? Good deal. All right. I'm glad to have you, buddy. Um, LT's here to join us for Hebrew class today, so he's going to knock it out. Um, yeah, yeah. So to understand godly zeal, let's go back and look at the story of Simeon and Levi. Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. Let's look at these, these two characters that come on the scene. Genesis chapter 29. We have to understand, you know, brothers fight. Uh, families fight, right? Maybe your family doesn't. Mine does sometimes. Genesis chapter 29. Um, I didn't write the verse down, but we see... Tell me if you see the, uh, the uh, blessing over Simeon and Levi. I forgot to write my verse down. Here it is. Um, verse 31. Adonai saw that Leah was unloved, so he made her fertile, while Rachel remained childless. Leah conceived, uh, conceived and gave birth to a son, whom she named Reuben, which is, See, I have a son. For she said, It is because Adonai has seen how humiliated I have been, but now my husband will love me. She conceived again and gave birth to a son. It, and said, It is because Adonai has heard me, he shamab me, that I, am able, that I am unloved. Therefore he has given me this son also. And she named him Shimon, which means hearing. Comes from Shema. It's where we get Shema. Once more, she conceived and had a son. And she said, Now this time my husband will uh, be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, she named him Levi, which means joining or attaching. And we see the role of the Levites is to attach us to Hashem, right? To attach us to the presence of God. That was their role. They're attachers. Um, so Levi was, was called the, uh, literally the joining together. 
So you see these guys are born in chapter 29 uh, of Genesis. Now let's jump forward to Genesis chapter 34. That should maybe ring a bell with you. Chapter 34 of Genesis. We see Simeon and Levi in their first major act of zeal in Genesis chapter 34. Their sister, uh, Dinah, Dinah, was, uh, she was taken advantage of by someone in the city of Shechem. And uh, these, two, these two brothers, who do we see come on the scene to avenge her, is Shimon and Levi. Uh, let me see, I didn't write my verse down for that one either. 25. Verse 25, on the third day after the circumcision. So they made all of Shechem, all the men get circumcised when they were in pain. Two of Yaakov's son, Shimon and Levi, those two Dinah's brothers, they took their swords, boldly descended on the city and slaughtered all the males. Is that zealous? That's pretty zealous. These two brothers are known for their zeal. They're known for their hasty, intense emotion and anger, but zeal. So it can be good and it can also be bad. Now let's jump forward. Genesis 42, 24. 42, 24. If you guys have anything to add, please don't hesitate to chime in. 42, 24. 42, 24. So we're moving through the story of Genesis here. 42, 24. I wrote my verse down for this one. It says, Yosef turned away from them and he wept. And when he spoke to them, he took, uh, he took Shimon from among them and put him in prison before their eyes. There's a lot of different, there's, there's some poetry going on there. If you realize, Shimon means my hearing. So he took from the brothers their ability to hear and he hid their hearing from their eyes. And if you read, I'm not going to get into it, but if you read the writings of Paul, and sometimes he talks about how his brethren have been partially blinded for a time, right? Because he's taken the hearing from them. Um, this, the story of Joseph parallels the gospel of Yeshua so perfectly. Let's jump forward. Genesis 49, 5 through 7. Genesis 49, 5 through 7. We're going to go through a lot of scripture today. I hope you're okay with that. 49, 5 through 7. Yaakov is on his deathbed. Jacob is on his deathbed. And he calls his sons to him. 49, 5 through 7. He says, Shimon and Levi are brothers. So basically he's saying, the hearing and the attaching are brothers. Related by weapons of violence. Let me not enter their counsel. Let my honor not be connected with their people. For in their anger they killed men. And at their whim, they maimed cattle. That's not a very good blessing, is it? No, it's not. And in fact, this is the last blessing that Shimon will receive. He's not even mentioned in in Deuteronomy chapter 33. All the other brothers, as Moses is giving his final blessing to all the tribes, Shimon is conspicuously left out. That tribe is left out of Deuteronomy 33. And it does not re- reappear again until the book of Revelation, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I want to, I wanted to take note. Let's go to Numbers 123 now. Numbers 123. So we're progressing in our story. The people of Israel in the wilderness. Numbers 123. We start with a census in the book of Numbers. How many people are in the, in the, the tribe of Simeon? 59,300 people. 59.3. 59.3. Now, how many people in Numbers 26.14 are in the tribe of Simeon? So after the, after the, uh, the Midianite debacle, 26.14, how many people are now in the tribe? Numbers 26.14. Twenty two thousand two hundred people are now left. Did their numbers go up? Mm-hmm. Twenty two thousand. What was it? Two hundred. Mm-hmm. So there's forty years in between these two numbers right here. Forty years go by. Mm-hmm. Normally, populations would go up, right? Mm-hmm. But we see a drastic decrease in those. It, what's really fascinating is if you go through and compare the front of the book of Numbers to the back of the book of Numbers, and compare: Did people lose some? Did people gain some? Why did they lose numbers? Why did they gain numbers? Um, it's a fascinating study. I encourage you to go through at some point. And because um, God's, God's word says that if we're faithful, if we're obedient to his word, he will grow and increase our numbers, right? We, we'll, we'll, we'll be fruitful. Um, but if we're disobedient, it'll be the opposite and our numbers, our numbers 
will, will drastically be reduced. 24,000 died in that plague because of the, the, the incident with the Midianite women. It, it, it's safe to assume that that 24,000, the bulk of it, if not all of it, was right here in Simeon because they were the main tribe involved with that sin. Um, what is the Hebrew word used three times in Numbers 25 that's translated? Some of your translations say jealousy. Others' translations say zeal. The, the Hebrew word there, I'm going to write on the board, is kina. Yeah, it's, it can be pronounced a couple of different ways. Actually, I'm going to write it in Hebrew first. It's spelled with a kaf, a noon. If you're, uh, if you're memorizing Hebrew alphabet throughout the week, a noon. And then it has a, uh, an aleph and then a he. And we will read this right to left. This makes a cuss sound, an, an in sound. And this is kind of like an open ah sound. Um, these two letters just make an open ah sound. So we have kina, kina. And I'll write it up here, kina. Um, kina is a very interesting word. If you ever do, uh, go to biblehub.com. You can search all the different occurrences of this word kina in scripture and see how they're translated. It's very fascinating. Sometimes they are translated as, um, as a merchant or someone took possession of something. Or they can be translated as a reed. Like when you go to the lake and you see big stalks of cattails coming up, like that's a, that's a kina. Um, but it is, it is most often translated as zeal or jealous. Zeal or jealousy, kina. But it could also be translated as merchant uh, or reed. Merchant or reed. It's also the same word, the same root as the, does anybody sound, sound familiar to anybody? Kana, 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 where, what is kana, what's significant about that? Or if I say it, like we say uh, in, in English, uh, kana, kana, what's that, what is that? Well, more specifically, the city of Cana was, was pop, made popular, Why? The first miracle, there was a wedding in Cana. That's the root, the same root we see here for zeal. So it could be translated as reed town, merchant town, or the town of zeal. We see Yeshua's very first miracle happen in John chapter 2 in Cana. Cana. It's the same exact root. Um, it, it's interesting, if you know that going into it, which is really, it's so, it's so amazing to study Hebrew and then read the Gospels. Because John chapter 2 says, this is the first miracle of Yeshua the Messiah to reveal his glory. And it happens in Zeal town. It happens in the town of Kina. Kana. Um, right after that is when he, this, John chapter 2, it goes right into him cleansing the temple courts. And he says, I'm consumed with zeal for my house. Um, Torah scrolls are written with a few things. So when you actually see a Torah scroll being written out, when we take a Hebrew class today, I'm going to show you a video on the projector of someone writing a Torah scroll. It can be written with two things, either a, a feather quill from a kosher bird or a reed, a kina. So just like I said that the, the Torah and the entire Bible was written using these characters, these zealous people, a Torah scroll, it can be written with a kina, a reed. So there's a lot of symbolism there too. Um, who has let's go back to our story of, of Pinchas and our story of, of uh, Zimri which one was more zealous which one was more zealous Zimri or Pinchas was Zimri even zealous I would argue that he was he was zealous for different things right he was zealous for his own lust his own flesh his own desires right his own gratification. I'd say he's zealous. He just had the wrong zeal. Pinchas was zealous, but he had the right zeal. You see, you can have wrong zeal. You can have right zeal. You can have, you can have right zeal for right reasons, but if you execute that zeal incorrectly, you've done it wrong. You have the wrong zeal. Make sense? So um, someone coming into uh, visiting our fellowship for the first time, and they're going to churches on Sundays. Um, is that a good time to, to throw a spear through, uh, through, through the Easter bunny or Christmas or things like that? Probably not. No. Yeah, those might not be the most ideal holidays for disciples of Yeshua. But sometimes we take our zeal 
for the things of truth, the things of the word of God, and we execute them incorrectly and without tact, without love. You studied this mm-hmm. week about this, that you know, Pincus wasn't looking, you may have been into this, wasn't looking for honor or anything. Mm-hmm. He was commissioned to guard the holy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he did it appropriately according to the word at that yeah. moment. Our problem is, is we pick up our own righteousness. <laughs> and, but our, you know, we're commissioned to guard the holy. Yeah. But we've taken up a stance that's not a watchful stance, we've taken up a offender stance. Yeah. More yeah. Instead mm-hmm. of a watchful stance. Yeah, and I would go so far as to say, it's probably going to get me in trouble, but Yeshua cleansing the temple and his level of zeal, of cleansing the temple and taking a whip and driving out the merchants or the, the Kanaim, the merchants out of the temple, the Kanaim, if you remember, the zealous people. They were zealous about making money in the temple courts. He was zealous about getting them out of there. I would argue that that position and that, that, that level of zeal and the execution of that zeal is reserved for the Son of God and the temple courts. And, it, and not in that context, if it's not in that context, it is not appropriate. All right? If it is not in that context, it's not appropriate. You can have the same zeal as Yeshua, and we should have the same zeal as Yeshua, but we can execute it incorrectly. And so our truth that we want to share with other people can come off as mistruth and they can harden their hearts to truth. And ultimately that's your fault. Let's just be honest. Because in your own pride, in your own pridely zeal, you want, to, you want to share something with them and you want to bludgeon them with that thing or drive it through them like a spear, you, you harden their hearts to that thing. Instead of, I always say in this movement, we need to be known by what we do and not what we don't do, Right? We need to be known by what we do and not what we don't do. And so often it's easy to let people define us and define ourselves. Oh, I don't do that. I don't eat that. I don't celebrate that. But what if you approach that same person and said, I celebrate the birth of Yeshua at Sukkot. You want to know why? Or I celebrate Hanukkah, John chapter 10. Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah. Not this, I don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. You know, eventually, yeah, they, they will eventually see the truth and, okay, Maybe those holidays have some sketchy origins or maybe they shouldn't eat ham on Easter or whatever the case may be. But at first we need to present things. What do we do? And we need to show them the love and the grace of our Savior. And eventually, you know, through time, they will eventually, you know, we don't want to, the the Pharisees were known for crossing land and sea and turning them into a, a, a son of Satan. And we don't want to do that. We want to make them loving individuals just like we are. Yeah. I got a couple that comes through this incident they may not come back um, she sings and he he presents a gospel message they usually come around New Year's um, but it was out at uh, Grace Point and Fellowship Hall and they have to support their ministry they have books and her CDs and some jewelry they they spend quite a bit of time in Israel and bring back jewelry and stuff and they set it up it was on Shabbat but they had set up some tables that weren't selling it had it on display until after sunset that it was uh, set yeah. because it was going afternoon session and uh, I had this guy that if I'm not mistaken he come out of the homeless community, community but besides fellowship was ministering to him and he came and he sat there for a little bit and then he got up and he walked over and he turned they had two tables and he flipped both of the tables mm-hmm. of merchandise upside down wow. and walked out the door yeah mm-hmm. And that's, that's what you're talking about, his overzealousness. He was mm-hmm. way out of line. Yeah. He was offended because it was on display on, on the Shabbat, but he was way out of line in doing that. And yeah. Whether they come back behind him, I don't know. He was, he was totally out of, out of order in doing that. It wasn't his place. He was, you know, whether he was right or wrong, he was totally yeah. out, of, out, of, out of order yeah. in doing that. One of the actions that we should never take. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. I, I think about Paul's words. I think, I think we we need to be reminded that we are ambassadors of reconciliation. Yes. Hmm. I mean, somebody ought to just study that a little bit. What does that mean? I mean, the Father, you know, we've been reconciled back to the Father. What does it mean to be an ambassador of reconciliation? In many ways, Jesus was an ambassador of reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. 
because of stopping the play and, yep. and reconnecting them to the Father because of yep. His holiness. Yep. Yeah, and I would say that his level of, of zeal, right. well, I would say the execution thereof right. was only proper within that context Absolutely. of the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we take the story of Pincus and we say, oh, well, he wasn't, you know, I need to, I need to amp up my, my zeal, you know, or like, I need to go around the workplace and, and just bludgeon people with, with truth. Um, but that's, that's only reserved. First of all, he was a Kohen, okay? This was, this was talking, this was life and death for the people of Israel. I mean, this was the Mishkan. This was what guided them through the wilderness and was, and was taking them day by day. This was the Shekhinah, the visible presence of God dwelling on earth. And, and there's a lot of different things that are, that are in that, that context that we're missing this today. Um, so we cannot take this story out of context and apply it to ourselves and get on Facebook and bludgeon people with truth. You know, and because there's a, a meme I, I saw on, on, on the internet, uh, a man on his laptop late at night and the wife standing behind him in her pajamas and she's just kind of frowning. And she says, uh, babe, come to bed. And he says, hold on just another minute. There's someone on the internet who's wrong. <laughs> Well, that's so true. Yeah, there's another. There's one more person on the internet who's wrong, and uh, but no. So having having the right zeals um, is is very important. So I mentioned earlier. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Let's look at the blessing that Levi receives because of his righteousness. Other than Abraham, there's no other person who who uh, in the Psalms it talks about how this act was granted to him as righteousness. Just like Abraham's obedience was granted to him righteousness. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Um, we're in uh, verse 8. Deuteronomy 33, 8. Of Levi, Moses says, Your Tumim and your Urim be with your pious one, whom you tested at Massah, with whom you struggled at Maravah Spring. Of his father and mother, he said, I don't know them. He didn't acknowledge his brothers or children, for he observed your word and he kept your covenant. They will teach Yaakov your rulings, Israel your Torah, and they will set incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Adonai, bless his possessions, accept the work he does, but crush his enemy's hip and thigh. May those who hate him rise no more. That's the blessing Levi receives. Do we see Shimon anywhere in there? No, he doesn't reappear until Revelation 7, 7. But before we turn there, why do we see Simeon's blessing falling off? Some speculate that it's because of this incident, that it falls off. But it doesn't reappear until Revelation 7, 7. If you would turn there, Revelation 7, 7. Some of you are getting good at sword drills today. Revelation 7, 7. We see, uh, we see Shimon is counted in the 144,000. What changed between Deuteronomy 33 and Revelation 7? What happened to where their numbers are sealed in the kingdom, the Messianic kingdom, and they're counted again? What changed? Thoughts? Repentance, perhaps? Yeah. Let's, let's look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. You might know where I'm going with this. Yeshua was just born. He's being brought to the temple for his Brit Milah, his circumcision. Luke chapter 2. And there's a man in the temple. What was his name? His name was Shimon, Simeon. Luke chapter 2. I don't have the verse. Somebody tell me where to start. Yeah. So 22, we'll start there. When the time came for their purification according to the Torah of Moshe. Uh, so this is actually later. This is when, when Miriam has to go up. This is after, after his Brit Milah. Uh, they took with him uh, Yerushalayim to present him to Adonai as it is written in the Torah of Adonai. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to Adonai. So they're kind of knocking out two birds with one stone. Miriam is presenting the offering of her purification after giving birth to a male. But they're also doing what's called Pidyon Habin, which is the, the, uh, the redemption of the firstborn. They're buying him off of, of, of Hashem. They're buying him off of basically uh, um, 
uh, the redemption of the firstborn, and uh, also to offer a sacrifice, a pair of doves or two young pigeons, which is really interesting if you, side note here, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 12, women have two options to take after they've given birth to a boy for their purification. They can take, um, I believe it's a, a, a sheep or a ram, or they, if they don't have, it says if they don't have the, the money to buy those things and offer them, they can instead do a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So are Joseph and Miriam wealthy at this point? No, they're going with the cheaper of the two options. They're poor. So is it possible that the wise men have visited them with gold, frankincense, and myrrh yet? No, probably not. Or else they would have the money to buy the, the higher of the two. So when people, you, th- you think of the, the, uh, the narrative that's presented on Christmas of the wise men coming the night that he's born and presenting those very expensive gifts, probably not true. So you can actually turn, turn people to the Bible and show them that's probably not true or else she would have paid for the more expensive of the two offerings. So there was in Yerushalayim a man named Shimon, which means what? Hearing. The hearing, yeah. This man was a sadiq. He was a righteous man. He was devout. He waited eagerly for God to comfort Israel. And the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Ruach that he would not die before he would see the Messiah of Adonai. Prompted by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, just like Zimri went into the the tabernacle courts, right? But he's going into the temple courts for a different reason. And when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him what the Torah says, Yeshimon, the hearing, he took him in his arms and he made a blessing to God and said, Now, Adonai, according to your word, your servant is at peace as you let him go. For I have seen with my own eyes your Yeshua, your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all people, a light that would bring revelation to the nations or the Goyim or the Gentiles and glory to the people of Israel. And it says Yeshua and his mother were marveling at the things Shimon was saying about him. Shimon blessed them and said to the child's mother, Miriam, this child will cause many in Israel to rise and to fall. He will become a sign, just like Aaron's staff became a sign. People will speak against. Moreover, a sword will pierce your own heart too. Now, do you think Miriam and Joseph for a second, when the picture of a sword piercing their heart, do you think they thought for a second about Pincus and Zimri and Cosby? Do you think that maybe being faithful Jews, they heard that story once or twice in their lives? I thought, oh, wow, I hope it doesn't pierce me like them. But no, it didn't. Uh, All this will happen in order to reveal many people's innermost thoughts. So what happened between Deuteronomy 33 and Revelation 7? I would submit to you that repentance happened and restoration happened, reconciliation happened. And again, God is faithful to that tribe. And they were brought back into the, the Messianic kingdom, brought into the fold. Yeshua happened, you know. The the wrath that was due to us, to the tribe of Shimon, was poured out on Yeshua. And um, absolutely, it it is a a blessing for sure. Let's let's keep going. Um, Are we are we as a people, as a messianic community, are we zealous? Do we have a tendency to be zealous? The only reason you're sitting in this room right now on a Saturday afternoon, studying scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. It's because you are zealous about his word. And that is a good thing. Many, many times in our culture, we look at people with zeal as being bad. Don't think that. Zeal is good. Executed in the right way, zeal is good. Carried out in the right way, zeal is good. But again, sometimes as we have our eyes open, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the fullness of the gospel, the Torah. And we're thinking, wow, there's so much. And I, I liken it to you've drank milk all your life. Right, All your spiritual life of following Jesus, you've been drinking milk. And suddenly someone cuts up a ribeye steak that they grilled and marinated overnight. Right, Making everybody hungry. And they cut it up and they touch it to your tongue. That was the first time that you thought, Sabbath. Or, wow, Hebrew words are just so fascinating. Wow. Or, you know, his name is Yeshua? That's 
amazing. Or, you know, you just have these revelations and you taste little morsels of the meat. But we take that zeal sometimes and we think, wow, everyone needs to know this. Everyone needs to believe like this. They would be just as happy as I am, just as their, their relationship with Yeshua would be beautified, just as mine was. But some people aren't as zealous. And we take that zeal and we go through another phase, a phase that I call being a Torah Nazi. All right? And you think, oh, well, they're not, they're, they just don't get it. I need to go verse by verse and show them all the proof text as why they're understanding Galatians wrong or they're understanding the writings of Paul wrong. And I'm going to take this, I'm going to just beat them upside the head as hard as I can until they see like I do. And then maybe they'll be happy and they'll be full of, of joy and peace and long suffering. But that's not the case. Now, what happens is we either harden their hearts or they, they turn into a bitter, fruitless, quote unquote, disciple. We've got to be careful with our zeal. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. Have you ever been overly zealous for something that had, I should say, little impact or value in the kingdom of God? Have you ever, have you ever been zealous for something that had little to no impact in, the, in, in God's kingdom? I know I have. I know I have. Why would, why would Satan want you to stay zealous about that thing or that person or that hobby why would he want you to stay zealous about that? Or that job? Distraction. Distraction, yeah. You know that Satan has no power in and of himself other than what we give him and allow him. All right? And the, his, his favorite tactic is to use our emotions. He uses those things, those weaknesses in us, and he says, see, you know, your dad wasn't faithful to you, or your mom wasn't faithful, your parents broke up, You're, they got a divorce. You know, there, there's... It just it, little things like that. He uses those emotions where you feel shame or you feel guilt. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to give up on that, okay? But those same things God likes to use to further his kingdom. Just like Moses said, I can't speak. I have a stutter. I can't speak. You know, or, or I mean, you name it. There's so many, so many characters in the Bible that have these slight flaws, physical flaws or emotional flaws. Elijah, Peter. I mean, these guys were just zealous, sometimes short-fused individuals that God decided to use to advance his kingdom. Satan likes to hijack those emotions and use them for his kingdom. Moving on, is Pincus, what he did, was it right or was, he, was it wrong? We kind of already have the answer to this. Was it right or was it wrong? It was right. Yeah. And what he did, he was rewarded. He, he received a blessing, a beautiful blessing because of it. Why wasn't he tried for murder? Thoughts? Maybe I'll make this a, a, a Shabbat homework question for you. He was commissioned to protect the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah. And he was just doing his job. Absolutely. Yeah. Murder and murder is about intent. Yeah. And his intent was holy. Yeah. Yeah, he was sanctifying the name. Yeah. Legally, he was protected by the Torah because he was guarding the sanctity of the Mishkan, the, temp- the tabernacle. So he could not be indicted for murder for that. Um, I already talked about what the context of his zeal was. But zeal does not always equal righteousness. God's zeal equals righteousness. But again, we can take that zeal and we can execute it improperly and harden people's hearts. To the next question, where is Yeshua in this Torah portion? Where is Yeshua in this Torah portion? Do we see any typology or shadow of who Yeshua is? Anybody? I know of a big obvious one. Turn with me to John chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 2. Where do we see Yeshua in this week's Torah portion? I'm going to try to ask that question every week. Where is Yeshua? So I believe that just like on the road to Emmaus, he opened the scripture and revealed to them on the road to Emmaus where he was in the Tanakh. Um, it was almost time for the festival of Pesach, Passover. So Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. He had to because he, it's one of the three pilgrimage feasts. In the temple uh, grounds, he found those who were selling cattle, sheep, pigeons, and others who were sitting at table exchanging money. Why were they exchanging money? Why were they just trading money? Specific yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The money that was commonly used in the land of Israel at that time had pictures, uh, idolatrous pictures of the Roman emperor on it, Caesar. And it was not kosher money. 
So it could not be brought into the temple and used to purchase a sacrifice for the temple courts. So what you had to do, if you ever been to a different country, you always, when you get there, you take whatever money you have in your wallet and you change it out for their currency. Sometimes you get ripped off doing that. Well, that's what they would do in the temples. You would go in there, you would take your, your pagan money, your Roman money, change it out for a kosher shekel. Uh, they just had probably a picture of menorah on it. And then you could go in and buy your animal. What the money tra- changers would do is they would charge exorbitant rates to, to do those exchanges. And so it wasn't such a bad thing in and of itself that they were changing out money, but that they were charging exorbitant rates to do so. And they were basically making it cost prohibitive to be able to go to the temple and be obedient to the commandments of the Torah. So Yeshua saw that. And uh, as my middle school students would say, he got triggered. So he made, he made a whip from cords and drove them all out of the temple grounds. And the sheep, cattle as well, he knocked over the money changers' tables, scattering their coins. And to the pigeon sellers, he said, get these things out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now, sometimes we stop right there. and Within Christianity, it's common to stop right there and say, I've actually spoken with a, a guy who has a master's in theology. Um, said, this is a proof that Yeshua is doing away with the temple worship system. <laughs> And actually said, this is him canceling out the temple worship system. God forbid. It's the last thing he was doing. Actually, he was doing the opposite. He was cleansing the temple. He was purging it. Because he says, um, zeal for your house devours me. So the Judeans confronted him, asking him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove you have the right to do all this? Notice they didn't say, hey, what are you doing? What, what are, we're not doing anything wrong. They knew their wrongdoing. They just said, hey, why do you have the authority to do this? So where is Yeshua in this week's Torah portion? I'd say he's Pinchas. He's operating in a, in a form of Pinchas. He's, he's full of zeal, righteous zeal. In the proper context, he's purging the temple and sanctifying the name of his heavenly father. <clears throat> Yeah. They were in charge of the extortion that was. Oh yeah, yeah. They owned so much of the money changer section there in the courtyard, and I mean, it's a perfect picture of the same thing regarding the holiness of the Mishkan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were they were they were idolizing money, just like they were idolizing Baal in in Numbers twenty five, twenty four. In what ways, in what other ways did Yeshua show zeal during his ministry? In what other ways did Yeshua show zeal during his ministry? Anybody? I would say the woman at the well. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting, if you look at Zechariah 14, 21, you can just jot it down or you can turn there. Zechariah 14, 21. It says the temple would no longer have merchants in it. It would no longer have merchants in it. He was, he was fulfilling. It would no longer have kenaim in it, merchants. It uses that Hebrew word right there in Zechariah 14, 21. The Messiah would purge the temple. I, I would speculate that the priests and the temple guards thought, okay, while wow, this guy is trying to fulfill this passage in Zechariah 14, are you the Messiah? You know, I would think that they thought that. Um, in closing, do we treat the things and the revelations or people God puts in our lives as merchandise? Are you jealous for your wife or for your husband? Are you zealous or jealous for them because they are like merchandise to you? And are you jealous for them because they are, are you jealous for them because they are a priceless gift that's been given to you? There's a big difference. So when the Ruach opens your eyes to something in Scripture, that you would not otherwise have seen, like the validity of the Torah, do you count it as merchandise or do you count it as a gift? Because our motivation, our motivation behind our zeal is everything. And if you count the revelation of the Torah to you as merchandise, something that you acquired yourself, your motivation and zeal towards other people is going to be completely wrong. And you're going to try to sell that to other people as opposed to praying for them, that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes. So our zeal has to fit the proper context. 
In Numbers chapter 25, verse 12 is the last verse we're going to look at today. 25, 12. It says, therefore, say, I am giving Pinchas a covenant of shalom. If you looked at a Torah scroll, the word shalom, uh, shalom is normally written like this right here. Shin, Lamed, Vav, Mim. For some reason in Numbers chapter 25, 12, there's an anomaly there. The scribes have preserved this for millennia. I mean, when the scribes come across something like this, they have, they have to repeat that quote-unquote mistake or that anomaly within a Torah scroll. The, the Vav, and I had a picture on my laptop, but Stacey's using it in the back. But you have, the Vav is broken like this. The Vav is broken right there in that word Shalom. Underline it if in your Bibles if you want to and, and write broken Vav. What does a Vav represent in the Hebrew language? Usually represents a man, a man. A person. So I would say that we see Yeshua again here. He's the broken man that brings shalom. He's the broken one. And it says that, that he's, he's the prince of what? Shalom. He's the Sar Shalom. He's the prince of peace. We cannot have true shalom without godly zeal, but we will not have true shalom with ungodly zeal. I'm going to say it again. We cannot have true shalom with godly zeal, without godly zeal. But we will not have true shalom with ungodly zeal. And I would also add that you will not have true shalom without the broken Vav, Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, who is broken on your behalf. Let's pray, and then if anyone has anything they want to add, um, we'll have a time before we, we do Kiddush and Oneg. But. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word that you made known to us. It was a gift given to us. It was not our own accord. It was nothing that we did or searched out. Uh, but Ra- F- Father, you drew us to it. Your Holy Spirit tugged on our heart and revealed greater truths to us. Help us to not count it as merchandise and something that we bought, but count it as a gift. Give us godly zeal. Give us love. Give us tact for one another. So we can share with them the truth that we've been gifted with. We will praise you and glorify you for all the wonderful things that you do. Thank you for your Torah. It says that it's all its paths are pleasantness and all its ways are peace. And we pray all these things in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen.